The subject of this presentation is the post-Civil War life of Robert Stringfellow Walker, my grandfather, and the establishment of his signal legacy, Woodbury Forest School. It all begins on the morning of April the 21st, 1865, when Confederate Colonel John Singleton Mosby assembles his 43rd Battalion Virginia Cavalry, better known as Mosby's Rangers, one final time. He directs that his farewell address to the troops be read, after which he orders the 43rd Battalion disbanded and the soldiers, the troops, discharged, free to go and do as they see fit. Now, most of the Rangers promptly go to a Union headquarters where they surrender, swear allegiance to the Union, and receive their parole papers. Mosby, however, and a small contingent of the 43rd turn their horses south. They're going to go join Joe Johnston's Army of Tennessee, which is the last significant Confederate fighting force left in the field. I am confident that Robert S. Walker, Captain Robert S. Walker, was riding with Mosby. His patriotism was demonstrated early on in 1861 when he joined the Confederate military against his father's wishes. He fought with bravery and skill. He was wounded three times uh, his second wounding at a fight in Mount Zion Church in Loudoun County, he was actually gut shot. Uh, the bullet, it is thought, went into his empty stomach. It took some time for him to recover, but he was back in the field in late November. And in December, he received his third and final wounding in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with a Union cavalryman whom he succeeded in disarming and capturing. Uh, as was described, uh, Walker was strong and quick, and that saved him uh, some misery from time to time, I'm sure. Now, uh, this party headed to Joe Johnson's army does not get even as far as Richmond when they learn that Johnston has also surrendered his army. So Mosby and his group turn and head back north into that part of Virginia that has become known as Mosby's Confederacy. And they come to Robert Walker's home, Rosney Farm, and the family story is that Mosby uh, gave a farewell talk uh, and bade farewell to the group from the front porch of Rosney. So now we have ex-captain of ex-company B of ex-Mosby's Rangers home. The cause that he had so valiantly defended has been crushed and he's been crushed right along with it. And he's got to somehow or other pick up the pieces and get on with his life. Now, he's home with his mother and his father and the farm is operating uh, people are there, uh, pretty good surroundings, uh, sounds like maybe a congenial atmosphere in which one can rebuild one's life. Not so. The dominant figure of Rosny is Robert's father, John Scott Walker. And John Scott Walker, uh, we need to learn a little bit about him because he figures prominently in the early years of this. John Scott Walker, I am sure, was a passive Unionist, of which there were many in the South. People who treasured the Union that their ancestors had fought so hard and worked so hard to create, and who really did not want to see the Union split up. They, they understood the problems but there just had to be some way to keep the Union. 
The end result for John Scott Walker, and I think a lot of the passive Unionists, was that they would not actively oppose the Confederacy, they just wouldn't go out of their way to help it. I think one of the things that uh, shows us uh, John Scott's uh, attitude is that it's pretty clear he did not buy any Confederate war bonds. In 1862, with a Union army marching on Richmond, John Scott Walker buys 230 acres of land uh, from the uh, descendants of General William Madison, a brother of the president. Uh, the farm is known as Woodbury. Uh, he has the money to do that. And then at the end of the war, John Scott starts lending money to people. Then in 1870, he buys a 255-acre tract adjoining the 230-acre tract. Uh, it's the Woodbury Residence Tract, the property that has the Jefferson-designed Madison residence on it. So John Scott has kept his money to himself. Uh, he hasn't given it to the Confederacy. Another thing you need to know about John Scott Walker is that he did not yield on his opinions lightly. For example, he once concluded an argument with a neighbor by beating the neighbor with his cane. Uh, and now, here, under his roof and under his control, is the son who defied his admonition to not join the Confederate military and went ahead and joined. We also have an additional problem. John Scott Walker's father had given Rosney to John Scott's five children, not to John. He gave John a life estate, but the residue was, going, was vested in John Scott's five children. And John Scott had been on a quest to get the residual interests in Rosny from his five children so that he, in fact, was the owner of the property. And he had secured the residual interests of four of his five children. Guess who was the holdout? Robert, under John Scott's roof, under his control. Now, if Robert was receiving any uh, consolation and sympathy from his mother, uh, Susan Herndon Stringfellow Walker, that didn't last long because she died in 1867. Well, how did all of this work out, or how was it working out? We get a snapshot from the 1870 census, and Robert S. Walker is identified as a hired hand, not a foreman, not an overseer, not a manager, John Scott's hired hand living with John Scott. If that wasn't rock bottom, it was darn close to it. But by 1874, Robert had decided on several things, three things in fact, that gave his life uh, direction and purpose and gave him what he needed to continue to progress and do the things that he did in his later years. His first decision was that he would turn away from his Civil War experiences and indeed many of the experiences of his youth prior to the Civil War, that they were not anything that he could build a future on. And my father, on occasion, and not many occasions, uh, said that he and his brothers would ask Captain Robert, their father, about an event or an occasion that happened back in the old days. The answer was always the same. Don't look back. There is nothing there for you. And that is the way Robert Stringfellow Walker essentially lived the rest of his life with the past to the rear and looking straight ahead. Indeed, you think about it, 
It was a survival skill, and he was an excellent practitioner of it. The next decision that Robert made was that no matter what else he might do, he was going to be a farmer. Now, obviously, he had gotten a very severe crash course in farming under John Scott Walker from 1865 on, uh, and uh, he certainly knew how to farm. Farming at that time also was profitable. I use that word profitable because most people don't think of that in terms of farming anymore, but it was back then. Farming also was acceptable in all levels of society and business. Uh, and in fact, some people referred to it as a calling, uh, a steward of the land, uh, uh, almost, a, uh, almost a seminary tone to the voice when they described uh, their occupation. Well, okay, so he, now he also, he did lean towards the mercantile field. And in fact, uh, for a time in the town of Orange, uh, he was running a mercantile business in addition to running the Woodbury Forest Farm and the Woodbury Forest School. Uh, I think the Gordonsville Land Panic of 1891 may have wiped out that mercantile business. It certainly wiped out a lot of them in this area when that panic hit. But basically, Robert wanted to be a farmer. Big problem, no farm. Now, was he going to be a hired hand to John Scott until John Scott finally keeled over? Maybe, we don't know, but we don't, didn't have to wait. In 1872, John Scott Walker gives Robert and his sister Sally, and they're the only two of the five children that are still alive, he gives to Robert and Sally that 230-acre tract excuse me, the 255-acre Woodbury residence tract. Now, has John Scott suddenly had a change of heart? Has he mellowed in his old age? Is he looking upon his son more favorably? Not a chance. The 65-year-old John Scott Walker is getting ready to marry his 41-year-old housekeeper, Mary Catherine Clark. And Robert and Sally have both filed their objections to this union. Miss Clark herself comes from a wealthy and profit and uh, profited family. Uh, she knows the value of a dollar and the worth of land. Uh, and uh, there are two things then at work. One is not only is this union by the separation of ages socially embarrassing, it could be that Miss Clark might be looking to add Rosny to her property holdings. Uh, whatever, John Scott, we already know, you can't tell him anything once he's made his mind up. So Robert signs over to John Scott his, his residual interest in, in, in Rosny so that John Scott now has it. It's all his, no matter what happens to it. And he and Sally move to Woodbury. Later, uh, John, after uh, Mary Clark's uh, father dies and she comes into her inheritance, she and John Scott actually execute a property settlement agreement. What's hers is hers, and what's his is his. I might just as an aside uh, point out that uh, within our family, we have two legal marital uh, operations that uh, people think are so modern. One is this property settlement agreement. The other one is uh, there's a prenuptial agreement back in our family. All of this before 1900. Thoroughly modern. The third thing that Robert Stringfellow Walker decides that he's going to do is that he is going to marry Ann Carter Nanny Goss of Somerset Farm nearby Somerset Farm. Nanny, well-educated for her day, very pretty, 
bright, capable, brought more to that union than anyone could have ever imagined. They were married January the 25th, 1874. And in the next 10 years, 1874 to 1884, six children were born to that union, all boys. And yes, immediately you say, that's the genesis of Woodbury Forest School educating those boys. And yes, it is. Yes, it is. That is the genesis. Uh, but I can't stand here and tell you that from educating six sons, things just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew till we have the Woodbury Forest School of today, which is a school that has an endowment slightly north of $233 million. Oh, excuse me, $330 million. Uh, annual uh, tuition, some, somewhat higher than $60,000 a year, a student body of roughly 400 boys, uh, and, and uh, 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 picked out of an admission list much larger than that, and an international reputation for excellence. I'd like to be able to say that it just grew into that. It did not grow into that. There were hurdles. There were severe challenges to the possible existence of Woodbury uh, beyond the educating, uh, education of the boys. And I'll, uh, I'll briefly run through four of these challenges. And you will not be, I don't think at this point, surprised to learn that one of the first challenges was presented by John Scott Walker. Now, John Scott, did not object to the homeschooling of the boys. Uh, in fact, uh, probably Sally and Robert, it, it certainly seems likely that Sally and Robert were homeschooled. We don't have any records to indicate anything else. And Robert was homeschooled well enough to be admitted into college. So John Scott had no problem with homeschooling the boys. His problem was with schooling generally. He did not want Robert to start trying to run a commercial school operation. As far as John Scott was concerned, it was the road to ruin. It was bankruptcy. You know how to farm? Stick with farming. Stay away from commercial education. Robert's response to this was in 1889, he set aside a separate building on the Woodbury property, took in boarding students, and hired a full-time professional educator, a gentleman by the name of J. Thompson Brown. In other words, Robert was doing exactly what John Scott Walker did not want him to do, committing Woodbury's resources to a commercial education operation. Well, we already know that John Scott does not yield his opinions lightly. So what is he going to do? There's no use talking to Robert or Nanny. Uh, you might as well talk to a brick wall. Sally might be the weak link. And keep in mind that at this point, Robert and Sally own Woodbury 50%, 50%. And what John Scott does is write a will. And now keep in mind, Robert and Sally are the only two surviving children. John Scott dies without a will. Robert gets half of John Scott's estate. Sally gets the other half. So John Scott writes this will. And in that will, he captures by description everything that Sally would be getting if he died without a will. But now he's captured it in his will. And the will goes on to say to Sally, if you will convey your 50% interest in Woodbury to a trustee, whom I will appoint, you can have this. Otherwise, no, you don't get it. John Scott and Sally both die in 1893. John Scott's will, we already know about. Sally's will, very simple. Whatever I have goes to my brother Robert. Woodbury survives. 
that first challenge. The second challenge was not too slow in coming. 1897, Robert has decided that he is going to build a combined dormitory administration academic building, a huge structure. He is planning to mortgage the Woodbury Farm up to the limit and borrow from neighbors. And in fact, he's making the arrangements to do that by 1897. And in 1897, remember J. Thompson Brown was hired in 1889 to be the first professional instructor? In 1897, J. Thompson Brown resigns. Not only that, when he leaves, roughly a third of the Woodbury student body is going to go with him. And here is Robert pledging Woodbury to build this building. Is it all over? Nope, we see some range of resourcefulness at this point. First of all, Robert goes out and hires J. Thompson Brown's brother, who is also an instructor, a teacher. And the brother comes <laughs> bringing students with him. Robert also appoints his oldest son, John Carter Walker, Carter, Uncle Carter, who has completed his education at the University of Virginia and is planning to go into the practice of law. He tells Carter that he is going to be the headmaster of this school. Carter, a college graduate, is going to take over the academic administration of Woodbury Forest School. And you did what Captain Robert told you. Now, he did not use the name Captain in his own lifetime. Uh, that was part of Don't Look Back. Uh, but he certainly acted Captain on many occasions. And he told Carter that Carter was going to be headmaster and Carter was headmaster for the next 51 years. My father completed his term of study at Virginia Tech, standing in the garden talking to some people. He had not gotten any instructions yet about where he was going to be in the Woodbury organization. Captain Robert came in a side gate. My father said he saw Captain Robert make an underhand toss and as this object was coming toward him, he recognized them as the farm keys. My father caught the keys. Captain Robert said, you're running the farm from now on, and turned out and left the garden, and my father ran the farm. So Woodbury survives that challenge to its existence. The third challenge does not incorporate any one particular incident or one particular instance. It was the competitive environment into which Woodbury was inserting itself as an academic institution. And I'll give you just a few examples. One was the Reverend Edgar Woods Presbyterian School in Charlottesville. Uh, those of you who know the city of Charlottesville, uh, this was a school that was located on Pantops Mountain which at that time was on the southern edge of Charlottesville. Now, of course, it's part of the city. In 1900, the school published uh, some information which told us that it had two two-story academic dormitory buildings. It had two five-room houses. Uh, it had other support structures, including a gymnasium and a bowling alley. Uh, and that it had, in addition to students from in the south of Virginia, uh, it had one student each from China, Japan, Germany, and Brazil. Uh, this school was obviously established, and that was 1900. Robert and his family are just moving into the brand new building that they have mortgaged everything that they own to build. Not knowing exactly yet how it's going to work, but they're going to try to make it work. Another institution, Locustdale Academy. 
located just a few miles up the road from the entrance to Woodbury. Established in 1858, it survived the Civil War somehow, and it offered a classical education in a, middle, in a military setting. It was a military school with a classical education, and it had five dormitory houses, uh, academic buildings, gymnasium, chapel, headmaster's house, and uh, in addition to boys from within Virginia, it had at least one student each from Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Maryland, and New York. And this, uh, all of that information, in fact, came from an 1870 census report. Remember where Robert Walker was in 1870? He was a field hand for John Scott Walker with education nowhere in his future at that time. And here is Locustdale Academy uh, at, operating at this level. Uh, in fact, about the time that the Walkers were moving into their brand new building, the Locustdale Academy was probably graduating its, uh, its, its only Rhodes Scholar, but it did. One of its students became a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, in later years, when Woodbury became more established, uh, it fielded a baseball team and they used to play Locustdale Academy. I understand no prisoners were taken. The last example, remember J. Thompson Brown. Woodbury started with him in 1889. He left them in 1897. He went to a school in Amherst, Virginia, taught for one year and that school suddenly closed. And after bumping around for uh, a few years, uh, he forms his own school, Brown's University School. That is soon visited by a tragic fire that kills two of his students. And we don't hear any more about J. Thompson Brown. You may be beginning to think that maybe John Scott Walker wasn't totally wrong. And that's that is correct. The Reverend Woods Presbyterian School doing so well in 1900. In 1906 it abruptly shut down uh, saying it was doing so for family reasons, whatever that means. Locustdale Academy suffered a disastrous fire, was underinsured and immediately locked its doors, never to reopen. Woodbury was very fortunate. Indeed, Woodbury was blessed to miss many of these things that simply took other educational institutions out of the running. The last challenge I'll describe to the existence of Woodbury was the death of Robert Stringfellow Walker in March of 1914. In his will, he left the school and the farm to the three of his sons who were actually working, running the school, and making their living from it, Carter, Joe, and John. He left cash legacies to Nanny and the other three boys, Robert, Frank, and Stuart. The problem is, there's no cash. Whatever profits the school was making had been plowed back into the school regularly. And had there been a need, a pressing need for cash, it was going to hamstring the entire operation because of all of the confusion of debt that would create. But Nanny and the three boys agreed that a Woodbury Corporation could be formed and they would receive what was to be their cash bequest in common stock in the Woodbury Corporation, and the, co and the school then continued. I said that Robert uh, turned away from the Civil War and those experiences to build his future. Well, the Civil War didn't turn away from him, and uh, there are some interesting vignettes of how the Civil War came back to visit him. One is Colonel Mosby. Now, uh, 
Mosby, uh, I think, held Robert as something of a favorite. Uh, he certainly was capable and trustworthy. Uh, in fact, uh, in April of 1865, early April, uh, Mosby had sent Captain Walker to Gordonsville, Virginia, to determine the bona fides of some information they were hearing about Robert E. Lee and Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And Captain Walker came back and reported that Lee had in fact surrendered on April the 9th. And in addition, the Confederate government was essentially non-functional, uh, meaning that Mosby was pretty much on his own to decide what to do with the 43rd Battalion. And then a few days later, it's Captain Walker that Mosby sends forward to advise the Union General that Mosby was being held up but would be coming to discuss the, the uh, future of the 43rd. So Mosby saw Robert as a little bit of a favorite. And uh, Mosby then showed up at Woodbury on occasion. And of course, uh, in fact, Woodbury educated Mosby's boys. And uh, while Robert didn't want to talk about the Civil War, and didn't talk about the Civil War, and instructed his children not to talk about the Civil War, and they did not, uh, Mosby always wanted to talk about the Civil War. Uh, I think it made Robert very uncomfortable, but here is Mosby, and you have to sort of put up with it. But one of the stories is, that on one occasion, um, Robert and Nanny were having some dinner guests over, and before the dinner guests arrive, here comes Mosby, riding up, coming into the residence, and Nanny exclaims that Mosby looks so tired and worn out. Uh, let me give you a little something, a little tidy, and uh, rest for a few minutes, and then uh, we can talk. And she gave him about five fingers of red eye and Mosby drank that down and they put him on a bed in the back room and he slept all the way through the dinner party uh, so they didn't have to hear his conversation about the wall. Joseph Bryant uh, who became the publisher of the Richmond Times Dispatch uh, and was a Mosby Ranger and, and he and uh, Robert had known each other as Rangers. Joseph Bryant's sister uh, had married uh, a, a, an adjacent neighbor to Woodbury. And uh, Mr. Bryant would come down occasionally to visit his sister and would usually cut through Woodbury and find Robert and find out how things were going. And uh, uh, he gave some favorable writings to, to Woodbury and he also loaned uh, Woodbury some substantial funds when Woodbury needed them. And uh, uh, he was uh, much appreciated for that. Another individual who showed up at Woodbury was Frank Strangfellow. Frank Strangfellow, the famous scout, uh, who, I mean, he hit, the, uh, he hit the lecture circuit after the Civil War, and uh, I mean, he was, he was a hero. And Frank, cousin Frank, uh, remember, uh, Robert's mother is Susan Herndon Stringfellow. Uh, Frank is uh, of that family. Frank, after the Civil War, uh, goes to the seminary and comes out as an Episcopal priest. And for a brief period of time, Frank is the chaplain at Woodbury Forest School. And at the time that Frank was chaplain, on one of his visits back, he was presented with this baby to baptize. It was my father, the fifth of the six boys. And I presume it, the, the, the deal had been worked out, I'm sure. But he took the baby, and when it came to name this child, he named the child Frank Stringfellow Walker. Uh, gave my father his name, and that's how I became junior. Uh, Frank Stringfellow ultimately left Woodbury to join the American army that was fighting in the Spanish-American War. Uh, he went as a chaplain because one of his sons uh, was in one of the units that went down to Cuba. Uh, 
and Frank, uh, uh, but Frank left his mark at Woodbury uh, like others. Now, Woodbury continued as a leading academic institution, its reputation growing steadily, but it was a financial high wire act all the way along. And it was cruising towards what could be its demise. It didn't get there, but it was very common that the leading light of a school, the teacher, the administrator, uh, the financial backer would die or retire or lose interest. And the school would simply like a light bulb just wink out. And here we are with Carter, Joe and John beginning to get some years on them. They're heading into a time uh, when they're not going to be able to keep Woodbury running. And there's no one in the next generation, including me, who wanted to step in there and take over the operation of that school. What to do? How to do? Well, Woodbury had survived long enough to where some of its earliest graduates had been in business and industry, had retired, matured, and had been extraordinarily, extraordinarily in spades, successful. And they realized that it was the Woodbury education that gave them that start to the success that they have enjoyed. And they were taking an interest in Woodbury, an increasing interest in Woodbury. They were becoming members of the boards of trustees and discussing with the Walker brothers what should be done. And finally, on January the 1st, 1927, the trustees of the school, all Woodbury alumni, formed a new corporation and bought the stock of the old Woodbury Corporation in addition, paid off all of the other private loans and debts that had been taken up by that time, also paid off the preferred stock that had been issued since then, uh, and essentially liquidated out the Walker family. Now, the school had grown and the economy and the country had grown over time. And the truth of the matter is, that Woodbury was worth about three times the value of the stock uh, that had been issued by the 1914 corporation. But the family said the value of the stock is all we want. Basically, they sold Woodbury to the alumni for 30 cents on the dollar. And Woodbury at that point was going to have a future. It wasn't going to be easy. It hasn't been easy. But at least those major hurdles that kept Woodbury alive long enough for the alumni to come to its rescue, uh, was that, that was accomplished. And it's a fantastic story. It's, a, it's, it's something that I think other people should to look into for their own ancestors if they were Civil War veterans. Maybe they didn't do exactly what Robert did, but they had futures also, and they are all worthy of looking into. I'm proud of our family. Uh, I wish I could have done something exciting, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy just to talk about it. And thank you for your attention.